Hello, everybody. It is my great pleasure to announce today the talk by Professor Renata Kalush and Andre Linda from Stanford. Uh, the talk will be presented by Renata, as I understand. And the title of the talk is Sequestered Inflation in M Theory and String Theory. Renata, please, one hour. Hi, everybody. Nice to be back in Moscow. Um, so my talk is continuation of the one which was given two weeks ago by Andre Linde. And uh, I will have some more material and some technical details on our most recent work where models which we studied before uh, have particular connection to M theory and string theory. So uh, the purpose of our recent work was to build supergravity models, which uh, sequester, which you can understand as, well, as protect phenomenology of inflation from Planck scale physics. As you know, inflation is like 10 orders uh, below Planck scale. And therefore uh, the immediate relation to string theory and M theory, which are at Planck scale is not obvious. So our recent version of uh, our cosmological models tried to clarify how much we can connect these models to fundamental physics. And I'll try to explain it. In particular, uh, the construction involves two technical, uh, multi two technical points which were not um, used so far. Uh, or used uh, only recently. The first one is construction of um, supersymmetric nilpotent chiral multiplet. And this is basically Volkov Akulov nonlinearly realized supersymmetry, which uh, in string theory is associated with anti D3 brain, which gives positive contribution to the energy of a system. And this become a, a very important part in cosmological constructions in our attempt to understand how to build uh, the sitter space in the framework of string theory. And I'll tell uh, more about it. Uh, but this is known more or less from 2003, uh, when we first uh, were building something which is known as KKLT construction of the sitter vacua in string theory. A more recent a new technical element, which I'll explain today, uh, has to do with uh, Goldstone multiplets. And those are um, uh, associated with new symmetries, which we have discovered by simultaneously discovering new uh, type of flux superpotentials which are associated with M theory and type 2B string theory. And I'll explain this part. And um, what uh, all this technical formal uh, study leads us to uh, is the possibility to explain certain features of um, observations. And the, the features are that uh, monomial potentials, which were favorite simple models explaining uh, cosmological observations, seem to be uh, not supported by the data anymore. And rather uh, potentials which have plateaus are supported. And so these new constructions, which I'll explain, which involve nilpotent chiral multiplet and Goldstone multiplet, they support uh, and explain almost the origin of plata potentials, which are favored by Bicep, Keck, and Planck data most recent. And they also provide the BMOD targets for future CMB experiments, which is the main uh, goal of my talk today to explain you the targets. So the targets um, which you see in this first picture, uh, they were um, 
published by uh, American Astronomical Society in 2019. And what you see uh, are the famous two observables in uh, inflationary cosmology, a tilt of the spectra known as NS. And here is the, um, here is R, is the ratio of um, uh, tensor to scalar uh, perturbations. And the blue data at the level of 2019 are the data which include Planck and early stage of bicep kick uh, together. And so what you see, the monomial potentials are here. At that time in 2019, they were not, they were kind of touching the data. Now the new data is below this blue line. So all monomial potential are disfavored. Now the plata potential, which we proposed back in 2013 are in this, oops, sorry in this gray band, which goes straight in the data. And uh, first of all, the data, if they fit any, if they discover a gravitational, primordial gravitational wave at any R in here, and if NS of Planck will stay here, they are covered by the alpha attractors, which uh, Andre explained in his talk. In addition to continuous values of, um, uh, I have, sorry, I have problem with my cursor, let me do it again. Okay, so the additional objects which I would like to explain are those discrete purple lines. There are seven of them. In particular, here you see the two yellow uh, uh, bulbs. Uh, one of them is for Higgs, this one, and this one is for Starobinsky model. And these are most favorite well-known models from much earlier time. And they become now part of the targets. And it is this seven Poincare disc, which you see here, the purple lines are Poincare discs. And the gray area are a time squared potential which depend on one parameters. So what you see as targets for future um, uh, BMOD uh, detection are, first of all, the continuous area here for just time squared potential. And then there are seven discrete values. Uh, and the purpose of my talk is to derive them for you and explain how they relate to M theory and um, uh, string theory. Uh, one of the more recent uh, figures, which is uh, from August 21, still before the most recent bicep kek release, is very close to this one, but there are certain differences. So there are no monomial potentials anymore. And here, uh, the uh, sweet spot of data, as they call them, indeed has uh, the same seven Poincare disks. It has fiber inflation, which I'll explain one of the string theory model. And there is a, a Higgs uh, inflation and there is a Starobinsky model. These are all targets. There is certain degeneracy. For example, if they will discover B mod at the level three times 10 to the minus three, it could be a Starobinsky model, it could be Higgs inflation model, and it could be one of the Poincare disks. But uh, so far, this will take a decade at least, or two decades uh, to come to this level of um, B modes. So uh, uh, let's go from this kind of a picture of what I would like to achieve during my talk to explain you the targets. Um, first, let me quickly review the status of inflation in string theory. So there is a textbook on this from 2015, which reminds us that the theory, which is the best fundamental theory, which we know, consists of this configuration, which involves M theory, which in the low energy 
approximation is just 11 dimensional supergravity. And then we have different corners here, type 2A, type 2B. Those are associated at the low energy with 10 dimensional supergravity. And there are other versions. And so with regard to the Waldschild formulation of string theory, uh, it is clear that this is a theory which has UV completion. But now when we want to explain the data, we have to switch from the... We have to switch from the world sheet to the space time and the total issue of uh, uh, completion is less clear. And so um, uh, the additional information about the development of inflation in string theory, in 2013, there was a review by Burgess, Kikoli and Keveda. Then in 2000, uh, in, um, uh, so then uh, in 2016, there were TASI lectures by Eva Silverstein. And uh, there was an article by Andre and me in 2018. And more, most recent one, uh, which is um, which is from um, uh, to, uh, from just very recent article, which Andre explained in his talk. And then it is known that uh, in preparation, there is a big review on string cosmology, which should come out in physics reports, but is not yet there. And to summarize this uh, discussion, I'll just add that uh, to switch from string theory to observations, we start usually with supergravity limit of critical string theory, which means that we are uh, at the level of 10 dimensional supergravity, which however includes local sources, D brains and O planes. And then to explain the observations, we obviously have to perform compactification to D equals four to explain the observations. And uh, all current observations appear to confirm that D equals four general relativity interacting with some matter is a good picture of uh, observations. There are, there are so far no known um, facts which would contradict this picture. Therefore, steps from the Waldschild uh, UV complete description to space time to D equals 11 or D equals 10, and then the consequent compactification involves many steps. In the end, uh, at best, we can have um, uh, phenomenological models describing the data, and we can just try to trace the relation to fundamental theory. So the reminder, some of you may have seen that in string theory, there are many moduli and we have to stabilize them to describe uh, inflation. And so this is just a, a picture which uh, may remind you that there are many, many steps going from D equals 10 to D equals four. And uh, the string landscape picture, which involves many moduli, which have to be stabilized. And it become clear that um, after discovery of uh, positive cosmological constant back in 2003, we have built something known as KKLT construction, which involves anti-D3 brain. And this was um, an important step uh, and at least an attempt to address the new cosmological developments. And then um, there was a parallel uh, approximation in supergravity. And this is how we constructed the Sitter vacuum inspired by string theory. And starting 2014, there were new ideas. And now let me remind you, and of course uh, in Moscow, this is well known, that uh, supersymmetry started with uh, Goldman Lichtman in 71. And for decades and decades, it was known that we are interested in linear supersymmetry, where for each Majorana fermion, we have a complex scalar. And this in particular, here you see the Vesumina model, 
which is minimal supersymmetric model with Majorana, Fermion, and a complex scalar. And with regard to this model, uh, various no-go theorem have been proven that uh, you can only have uh, anti de Sitter vacuo with negative or a Minkowski vacuo with vanishing cosmological constant. We also know from LHC, they have not seen Susie partner uh, so far. Meanwhile, in Kharkov, uh, Volkov, Akulov, and a big group of people was developing at about the same time, non-linearly realized supersymmetry. And here, uh, a partner of one Majorana fermion state are two Majorana fermions. There are no bosons in this multiplet. And this non-linearly realized supersymmetry was not um, in big um, attention. And however, what happened after um, discovery of the Sitter vacuum, it became clear that the technically uh, special feature of Volkov Akulov uh, construction is the presence of uh, positive contribution to the energy, because as you see, the Lagrangian is uh, negative and the Hamiltonian is positive. And then soon uh, uh, in 2015, uh, Berkshoff, uh, Dan Friedman, Van Proen, and myself, as well as uh, two people in Japan, Hasegawa and Yamada, we have built uh, pure supergravity, even without matter multiplet, the supergravity which has the Sitter vacuum, and these are positive cosmological constant. So this was the first understanding that if we want to respond to, um, to the positive cosmological constant to discovery via supernova and other cosmological observation. This is part of our way of addressing this issue at the technical level. Uh, meanwhile, in KKLT construction, it was clear that uh, to obtain anti-deceiver vacuum for the volume, uh, stabilizing the volume is possible, but this is a negative cosmological constant. And this is stabilization of volume of extra six dimension. But uh, to make it positive, uh, we added anti D3 brain contribution so that the final um, plot you see here, and then in this way, KKLT and including anti D3 brain uplift gave us a positive cosmological constant. In supergravity language, this uh, same story is described by the Keller potential, which is an extra super field. So T is a volume and S is this nilpotent multiplet and the super potential depends on it. And so nilpotent means that S squared equals zero. And therefore, despite this is a supersymmetric multiplet, it is literally uh, Volkov, uh, Volkov Akulov case because the scalar is not independent, it's just bilinear of fermions. And so the condition of nilpotent multiplet was studied starting with Volkov Akulov 72. There were many people interested. Um, one of the intermediate important uh, uh, papers was by Kamargotsky and Cyberg. And then in the context of cos cosmological observation, it become uh, a very important um, technical tool, which we are using in our current models. And all of this is called supersymmetric uplift, because as you see, this model is perfectly supersymmetric, still produces the Sitter vacuum and positive cosmological constant, but it involves non-linearly realized supersymmetry. So here is the uh, schematic picture. If we want the sitter with positive cosmological constant at the level of string theory, we are adding anti D3 brain to certain configuration. And at the level of supergravity, we are involving a nilpotent superfield as squared equals zero. 
Now let's go to cosmology. And so this is um, uh, a picture from one of my talks in 2018. Uh, and this um, uh, red brown area in RNS plot is W map and the data go from 2010. Whereas the blue area is Planck 2018. And there is a fantastic progress as you see. So everything which was allowed here in 2010, uh, after this shrink to the blue area, many, many model become uh, irrelevant to the data. Uh, and so let me just explain what you see here. So the, uh, this red brown is W mark, map, the blue is 2018 Planck. The yellow uh, band is alpha attractor models, which Andre explained in the previous talk. And uh, here is nature and inflation model, very popular at that time. And here are uh, monomial uh, models. One of them is known as axion monodromy, this one. Uh, and this has a potential phi to the power two third. And R squared inflation, Starobinsky model is here. And we have Higgs inflation here. In string theory, uh, there were a number of models invented earlier. For example, there was this lovely racetrack inflation model in string theory but it just had NS less than 95. And this model was perfectly fine in 2010, but it was clearly uh, eliminated by the new data because this area is not inside the blue spot. There was a very interesting set of models uh, determine inflation or in string theory, it was D3D7 model and it has NS 0.98, so it is here. I will explain more about this model. Then there was a KKL MMT model, version of it inflection model, and this was less than 93. This was obviously out. And there was inflation model, which has R0.13, which after, uh, so it was okay at the W map level, but it was out because 13 is here. And so this was, uh, is, is not in the blue area anymore. So this is out, this is out, this is out. This model, however, it still remains interesting. And some of you who may have heard about tension uh, with regard to H0 may also heard that uh, people are building uh, early dark energy models, which tend to move NS uh, to larger values. So we keep an eye on this model, depending how things will develop with regard to observations. So this is the picture which was shown in Andre's talk, and this is most recent bicep kick. So this was the area of Planck, which was blue in the previous picture, and this is the new uh, data. So what you see that natural inflation is uh, clearly disfavored and action monodromy, the original model phi to the power two third is out of the uh, uh, two sigma area of uh, data. And so R is now less than 0, 0, 0036. And uh, the error bar apparently is 0, 0, 009, but in some number of years, they promise it will be 003. So we'll have a better understanding of where we go. So uh, this is a short um, summary of how to save action monodromy. There is a paper by Damika Kaloper and Westphal. They had to uh, do lots of things to keep the model alive uh, or um, forget lambda CDM and move to new early dark energy. And this is just to tell you that it is hard to stay in the sweet spot. And the same about monomial potential. In particular, they had to go from phi to the power two third to phi to the power one over 10, which is kind of ridiculous. 
very small power of phi. And in fact, you end up even here. So to go down below in R, because the data will, if they don't find uh, gravity waves here, you have to go down. For this purpose, they had also to change uh, kinetic terms. So it is hard to stay in the current uh, small area uh, which data allow. Same happened with nature inflation. Instead of a simple model one minus cos, uh, there are a number of additional uh, um, elements which have to be added to the model. And uh, it either includes many additional terms or even many additional steps. And this is just to say that the model, uh, which are outside of the data, can be still improved by adding various things to them. And so if you have more terms in the potential and more parameters, you can fit the data. Now, um, as a kind of entertainment, um, so let me tell you uh, my personal interest <clears throat> to primordial gravitational wave uh, detection was somehow related to the fact that um, we talk to people who actually do the experiment. And so there are two uh, major uh, CMBS4 sites. This is Chile and uh, Atacama. And so the experiments are known as polar bear, Simons array. Uh, Simons, they, many of you know, uh, Chen Simons and Simons as mathematician, he is interested and he actually gave a lot of money to build the Simons Observatory. There is also ACT and CLASS experiment, and this is in Chile desert. <clears throat> the other uh, site is uh, South Pole. And what you see here is the South Pole telescope and bicep Keck teles telescope. And um, Stanford students and postdocs uh, spend winters at South Pole, and then we, we talk to them. And these are real people who go and do the measurements. And uh, this is what uh, helped to shrink this, uh, this the observable uh, area. Now, another interesting uh, construction which is going on right now, and director of uh, Vera Rubin Observatory is Professor Steve Kahn. He is at Stanford. And uh, here it is. And so uh, the, determining the nature of dark matter and dark energy, two of the greatest mystery of modern physics is their purpose. Uh, one more uh, interesting um, uh, site is Ali region of Tibet. And this is um, uh, at altitude 5,250 meters, the highest ground-based CMB observatory. And uh, people from there were visiting us and explaining about all of this. And the advantage of this particular site is that it, it takes an alternative data. And they have in 30 kilometers of, from the observatory, there is an airport. And so there is a hope that they will eventually also get uh, data and we will know more about uh, uh, B modes, about primordial gravitational waves, which is this factor R in plots, which I showed you. Uh, and these are so far all ground based experiments. And so the current limit is R less than 0036. And um, it comes from combination of Planck and Bicep Keck. And so all the ground-based experiment I have shown you, SPT pole, advanced act pole, bicep kick and polar bear. The next generation, uh, which are now under construction is Simons Observatory, South Pole Observatory and CMBS4 experiment. So the role of CMBS4, which is a very big collaboration to just on the ground <clears throat> to have more and more detectors. Their goal is to have 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 of them. <clears throat> there is also a, a satellite mission called Lightbird, and it was um, uh, approved in Japan. Uh, and so this is the second uh, strategic uh, large class mission selected by JAXA. JAXA is an analog of NASA and ESA. And 
it will observe the sky from L2 point and uh, it will be launched at the end of 2020 and it will have 5,000 detectors. Their goal is to, uh, to go from this value, which you see here from 0036 to 10 to the minus three for R and either detect or uh, give us a new bound. <clears throat> Here's the satellite and it is known to be uh, funded as of now, and hopefully it will fly. And uh, it, has, it, it goes in collaboration with various other space agencies in the world. So let's look again on the targets. So the, uh, uh, I'll repeat, there, are, there is this gray band, and those are alpha attractors with alpha less than 10 because 10 is already ruled out. And so it has to be below to fit uh, 0036. These models are associated with symmetries of the kinetic terms and the symmetry is SL2R. And people who know about um, Poincare disk also know that it is SU11. There will be a little bit more about it. Then we have these Starobinsky and Higgs models here. And we have seven Poincare disk where three alpha value are discrete, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the symmetry of the kinetic term is associated with uh, SL2R to the power seven. So it is significantly bigger symmetry. And therefore, if, if they will discover B modes at any of these seven uh, areas, we will have a more clear understanding of uh, fundamental symmetries behind our uh, cosmological observations. This is the picture from uh, a Flagger talk in August 21, where you also see in slightly different scale, these seven discrete um, uh, disks, which were invented uh, by Sergio Ferrari and me in 2016. You also see fiber inflation by Kikoli Burgess Kiveda, a model from 2008. And of course, we have uh, Starobinsky and Higgs, and those are the main targets for doing these 10 to the five detectors on the South Pole or uh, uh, to, to launch the satellite mission. And so if uh, they will discover it in one of these green uh, regions, that would be great because it would mean uh, significantly more uh, symmetries in the early universe model. And uh, some of you may have heard that E77, which embeds the seven disk, is the uh, duality symmetry of maximal supergravity, n equals eight supergravity. So one of the ways to explain flatness of the potential in inflationary theory is to start with theory with shift symmetry. And the famous example is axion potential and natural inflation or axion monodromy. And both of these simple version of the models are now disfavored. Meanwhile, if we uh, have Goldstone shift symmetry of supersymmetric flat directions on which our models are based, uh, those are Saxion flat directions, partners of axions. And when we have the nilpotent multiplet, we built such models in string theory inspired supergravity, and those are alpha attractors. Uh, also, fiber inflation, Higgs, and R squared inflation. Inflaton is a scalar rather than a pseudo scalar. And so, so far the model which survived the most recent data appear to have this Goldstone type shift symmetry, which I'll describe soon. And uh, in early supergravity, starting with the famous paper by Kawasaki, Yamaguchi, Yanagido in 2000, it was realized that in addition to inflaton multiplet, we need an extra super field as a tool of model building. And it become even more clear that this is a nilpotent chiral multiplet representative uh, Volkov-Akulov symmetry or anti-D3 brain. And 
the new models are really uh, based significantly on these nilpotent multiplets. So uh, I will uh, repeat what uh, some of you may have seen in the previous talk by Andre Linde, that uh, we have um, a hyperbolic disk and therefore the kinetic terms represent the it geometry. The kinetic term is not uh, flat and there is a complex um, coordinate of the disk and ZZ bar is less than one. And uh, if we go to canonical variables out of uh, R, uh, it gives us tanch. And therefore, when the angular direction is stabilized, this is the typical model where F is some function of tanch. And the simplest one is the potential is ZZ bar to certain power or tanch to center, center certain power. And if as people do today, they would like to create primordial black holes near the exit to inflation, they add a cubic polynomial in terms of tanch. So those are uh, pictures which um, Andre have shown and just a reminder that uh, T models have tanch to some powers and E models have one minus exponent to some power. And Starobinsky model is a case where alpha equals one in this exponent. And uh, we can also write these models in geometric variables. They're extremely simple. Here we have dz dz bar divided by one minus zz bar squared. And the potential is just zz bar. And uh, in terms of t variables, we have dt dt bar divided by t plus t bar squared and the potential is t minus one squared. So in geometric variables, these models are extremely simple and they always have this parameter alpha. Um, so the reason there are two versions has to do with this uh, well-known uh, transform from half plane to a disk. And so this is a z variable and this is a t variable. And um, with regard to symmetries, when we are dealing with uh, geometry of the half plane, we have SL2R, which, is, which has this element. And when we have a geometry of a disk, it just a uh, reshuffling of variables, alpha, beta, gamma, delta in the general element of either SL2R or SU11 group and they're uh, isomorphic. And this model therefore have these two versions. Kinetic term has a strict symmetry, but the potential slightly violate the symmetry. And so in supergravity, it just has to do with the choice of the killer potential. In the disk case, it is minus three alpha log one minus ZZ bar, or minus three alpha log T plus T bar. And the curvature of the modular space is given by minus two over C alpha. So the interesting uh, story here that there is a symmetry, either SU11 or SL2R, and the only parameter which defines the value of the um, uh, gravitational waves is the curvature of the Keller geometry. And uh, a, a while ago we have realized that uh, these geometries were uh, uh, shown in Escher's uh, paintings long time ago. And uh, this is precisely the story of angels and demons, which seem to be smaller and smaller near the boundary here or here. But in fact, they're of exactly the same size as the one here. And um, what is interesting <laughs> that three alpha which is just the radius square of the corresponding Escher disk in cosmological models is equal to 10 to the three times R, where R we are measuring. So in a sense, people who do the measurements, if these models are uh, valid, they're measuring the curvature or the size of the Escher disk. And so when we plot these models in recent bicep Keck plot, as you see the, um, the T models associated with SU11 symmetry 
are in this yellow band, whereas E models, they go slightly different. They bend towards larger values of NS, and then they go to the attractors and they all agree with each other later. This is one of the early uh, pictures for alpha attractors, which we plotted you know, numerical values. So we can start at any polynomial here at very large alpha, but when alpha is decreasing, they all go in the, in the same place. And the same with E models. We can start with phi to the six or phi squared or phi. And after, uh, after, dec after decreasing alpha, this by the way is alpha equals one, Starobinsky Higgs level, then they all become uh, same models and uh, slightly different above the attractor points. But um, if they don't find gravity waves for a long time, they will be all the same. And this is another picture, which again, is just the result of numerical investigation. You can start with phi cube or phi squared or phi or phi to the power two third and make this modification of kinetic term, just announce that you have a, uh, disk geometry, and then all these models go in the in the blue sweet spot of data. This is another picture. So if you want to know what is Poincaré hyperbolic disk, you go to Wolfram, and you will see this is the geometry, and this is where you see that despite they look like small triangles, but they're actually exactly the same, just geometry. And so we had this paper Escher in the sky. And the special role of these three alpha discrete, which are uh, the main uh, target, because experimentalists asked us, can you provide us with any discrete target? Then we'll know that at some point we went through such target or through next target. And by that time, we already knew that there are these discrete targets such that when three alpha equals one, this is precisely the unit size disk, which you will find in description of Poincaré hyperbolic disk. And simultaneously, it is the next CMB satellite mission target. And the difference between them is precisely the size. And so this will be tested by uh, CMBS4, and light bird. So this is the big one, three alpha equals seven. It is on the top. Then we have six, et cetera. And this one, three alpha equals one, the smallest one is very deep. So it will take decade or two to reach this level in R. So why we have this hyperbolic field space here? Basically it is an assumption that if we assume SU11 or SL2R symmetry, this is the choice of n equals one supergravity. But if we consider M theory in D equals 11, compactified on twisted seven tori with four fluxes, which is a G2 structure manifold, in D equals four, we find those discrete seven unit Poincare disk because just the statement that M3 and D equals 10 compactified on G2 structure provides us with scalar manifold, which is a product of these seven T1, T2, T3. And what is it? It has a very clear meaning. So first of all, the symmetry is SL2R to the power seven. But secondly, the radia of seven circles are related to to this one, starting from R5, uh, 6, 7, et cetera. So it has a very clear interpretation to in M theory, compactified on G2 structure. Or we take string theory in D equals 10, we compactify it on T6 over Z2 squared. And in 10 dimensions, there is one more modular, which are stringy axion dilaton. And therefore we again end up with seven moduli and these seven moduli with this geometry derived from M theory produce these B mod targets, seven Poincaré disks. So we have realized that once we have a, um, 
uh, nilpotent multiplet, which in this slide I call X because T is um, because we have STU models. <clears throat> if we have these technical <clears throat> models, which are the most recent version, the most advanced was uh, from uh, last year, we end up with um, potential of our choice. And this is highly non-trivial. Moreover, <clears throat> at the exit of um, inflation, these models have cosmological constant, uh, which has two contribution. One contribution is positive, as I told you from Volkov Akulov constant. And the other contribution, which always was negative from Gravitina. And uh, there is anthropic explanation in this context of um, observed dark energy, where we can at least say that there are many choices of uh, positive constant, many choices of negative constant. And apparently the world where we live um, is the one where this one is slightly, slightly bigger than this one, which gives us a small positive cosmological constant. Now, um, I switch to I switch to uh, our recent work, which consists of three parts: M theory cosmology, Actonians, and it is quite amazing that uh, on one hand I I will tell you a few words about Actonians because they supplied us with the uh, superpotentials of the form which have these Goldstone directions. On the other hand, we really use it for actual observations. And therefore we introduced the concept of sequestered inflation, uh, which is particularly interesting in context of type to be string theory. And hopefully, so I'll quickly go through example. And uh, the meaning of sequestering is the following, that in our models, that uh, if we have certain super potential such that it has a Minkowski vacuum along certain directions and in absence of nilpotent field, it would just describe supersymmetric Minkowski flat direction. But then we uh, add an additional phenological uh, part of the story. And it turns out that the result does not depend on the value of this fundamental theory super potential just supplied us with flat direction. And this allows to disentangle sequester dynamics of inflation from large energy scale encoded in this kind of super potential. And so I, I will say there are two steps in this procedure. First, we have discovered W flux in string theory and M theory, which provide this a flat directions or Goldstone super multiplets. And then at step two, we uplift them to plata potentials. And, and therefore the technical tools beyond the one which were known involve Goldstone multiplets, which are associated with symmetries of novel super potentials. And we use a rather well known by now uh, technical tool, which is a nilpotent multiplet. And this allows us to make Goldston into a plata potential. And so this is just a picture. So <clears throat> if I use this two step, the red line, as you see, is a Goldston. And uh, when I perform step two, I see I have a plata, but you can't see it when you are at the scale of Planck and uh, uh, but if you use something like um, magnifying glass, because each square inflation is nine orders below Planckian density. And then suddenly you see in this scale that what happened, the whole red line, which was totally flat, now gives you alpha attractors because uh, it allows this exit from inflation and in small dips which you cannot see in the scale of M Planck equals one, but in the scale, which is 10 orders below, you can see, and this might provide one of the explanation of uh, importance of plata potential, which um, uh, 
apparently are in good agreement with the current data. And so the results are in these models, we have answers for NS in the attractor region and for R, and either we have discrete set of values, which they might or might not discover gravitational waves. And if they do, it would mean that maximal supersymmetry <clears throat> associated with M theory and string theory is the um, story in the early universe, or they will discover uh, gravitational waves somewhere uh, and this for some continuous values of three alpha, not precisely these discrete ones. And this would indicate that minimal supersymmetry and four dimensional supergravity are behind our models. And so if this is a minimal supersymmetry, the prediction is in this continuous band, any R is possible and NS as it is feeds the data but maximal supersymmetry would mean that they would discover one of the hyperbolic disks. And the numbers are uh, like that. So when three alpha is between one and seven, R is between 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus three. And this is the region where uh, light bird hopes to get us the data. And uh, I think I'll skip all um, technical uh, slides except one. So people uh, may, some people may enjoy the fact that um, we looked at actonian fluxes and um, we have noticed that the only way to make uh, our uh, M-theory compactified on G2 compatible with uh, properties of actonians is to choose this kind of superpotential, which nobody has seen before, we have not seen, which is a product of two differences between two moduli. And as a result, and the choice has to do with um, Cartan, Schouten, Coxter, actonian multiplication table. And there are 480 actonian convention and if we want the physics to be independent of the choice of the convention, this is the only choice. And it has to do with the final plane and all kinds of beautiful mathematics, which I'll skip because I have no time. And in short, uh, because of the property of the super potential, we have these Goldstone multiplets. And I think in type 2b, we found many of them and I'll just skip because I, I would like to come to conclusion. And uh, we use this new type of models and new type of the potentials. We had to do a lot of numerical studies to justify that uh, out of seven moduli, we end up with cosmological theory, which has exactly a single inflaton, which is evolving, whereas everybody else is heavy and doesn't spoil the evolution of a single inflation. We had some two valley cosmological scenario and a merger of two of them and lots of numerics. Uh, fortunately, we have very, very strong young people helping us with this program. So these are benchmarks for T models and E models, which uh, are now uh, looked at carefully with regard to what exactly it would mean because now we are somewhere here, but the data will come about this region. And it is between this 10 to the two and 10 to the three that we have our most interesting targets. It remains to be seen if they will find something or not. And so I will uh, end up with this particular slide. So this is bicep kick. Uh, recent data. And if I put uh, T models in yellow band and uh, E models in red band, and I put just a top disk, which is three alpha equals seven, or you see it here in uh, in enlarged figure. Uh, so once they improve their precision, they either will uh, support this model or they will say, no, we didn't find anything here. But to go to the next from three alpha seven 
to three alpha equals one will probably take uh, a couple of decades. And uh, we don't know if they will find something there or not, but if they will not steal the models with continuous uh, values of uh, curvature will still be valid. And it would be very interesting to find out what will happen. And unfortunately, it will take many years. And if the society will be strong again and powerful and we will fly scientific satellites, hopefully we or next generation of physicists will know more. And I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Renata, for your great talk. Uh, questions, please. Raise hands, please. And uh... <coughs> okay. Yes. Well, okay. Uh, I don't see yet. Fernanda. Oh, yeah, the uh, please. Uh, Fernanda. Yes, so I'm here. <laughs> Fernanda, ask your question. Fernanda. Hello, everyone. Ivan. Nice to see yeah. you. Yes, a beautiful talk. I really enjoy can it. I, can I say something? Yes. Just yesterday, people um, who are making a new proposal for um, Bicep Kek send us a question asking about uh, whether they should include a fiber inflation model in their next proposal. Oh, and wonderful. our answer was, of course, yes. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Your question now. Excellent, thank you. Okay, no, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think you skipped the, the, the parts of on the, on, when you were addressing the, the type to be realization. Could you yes. talk a little bit on that? Yeah, I would be absolutely happy if people don't mind. I want to show you uh, how surprising was what we uh, uh, noticed in type to be. So first we have found uh, with Actonians that uh, the potential, the super potentials have this unusual property. Simply, there was no way to, to get anything else if you go from M3 on G2. And this is covering all 480 different versions of Actonians. But then we decided to see what we can learn in um, type 2B. And so what we did, we took the version of type to be compactified on T6 over Z2 squared mm -hmm. uh, or in T fold with generalized fluxes and O3, O7 planes. Mm -hmm. And there was this very well-known paper by Alda Zabal, Kamara, Font, Ivanis, and they gave this form of the superpotential. Mm -hmm. But it was necessary, as you know, to satisfy tadpole condi consolation condition in type to be string theory. Mm -hmm. And many people who are less familiar, we just had to solve Bianchi identities because in addition to supergravity, we have all these local uh, objects, uh, uh, fluxes and, and O3, O7. And so we, we took their general form and we solved the Bianchi identities. And it was amazing. And uh, it was um, Tim Raza here in the US and uh, Yusuke Yamada in Japan. They made this wonderful notebooks and suddenly they found the solution of all of these equations mm -hmm. and they produced the following Goldstone directions. One was, um, th this is an example. And to our great surprise, they were precisely of the form uh, which was predicted by Actonians in M theory. It was always a product of two difference between modular. Therefore, VW equals zero when some of the modular coincide as well as W prime, because there is a product of two difference. And this is what came out from tadpole conditions. And so if we have one flat direction, we're just observing by just looking at our solution of tadpole conditions that, uh, so the seven moduli in type 2B theory consists of S, which is the obvious axion dilaton in type 2B. And there are three uh, T moduli and three U moduli, complex structure and uh, volume. 
And then this gives us precisely one symmetry and one Goldstone supermultiplet. And therefore the symmetry is, you can take any of the modular and shift on arbitrary function of all, our, all moduli. And this is the source of this one massless and six, ma six massive supermultiplets. And it all came from mm -hmm. enormous computation uh, solving tadpole condition. Uh, and so somehow type 2B knew about the actonions in M theory on G2. This was another example we found. And again, is a difference between combination of moduli. And here we had three flat directions. T1 equals T3, U1, U3, S equals U2 and T2. And these three Goldstone multiplets correspond to three symmetries. And here they are, really tricky. You can shift uh, these four modula by the function of this one, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, you get three massless and four massive supermultiplets. Mm -hmm. And then at step one, you start with the uh, standard Keller of on the disks. And, and then all you need to establish that without the additional step by a nilpotent multiplet, all you have is you have uh, six heavy moduli and one massless. Then you add the phenomenological part. It's here the masses are a lot of numerical. Work. One is massless, this is Goldstone, and six are very heavy. This is Planck and scale. Mm. Then we make this step two with the nilpotent multiplet of our choice. And here we go. We end up with precisely one uh, uh, potential, which is plateau. And we check that everybody else is very heavy. That is the story. I hope I didn't mm -hmm. make too much time. Thank very you. Good. That's perfect. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much. OK. More questions, please? Please, can I ask? Oh, please, yes, ask. Yes, please. Arif. So, again, best greeting from the Lebedev Institute, Renata. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my admiration uh, that you find ways and logic in this extremely complex model building paradise. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, I have two short questions. First one is, you mentioned this bolt attempts to find to observe the gravitational waves. Do they? My question: Do they mean the shock waves, gravitational waves from some collapses in cosmos, or the relic gravitational waves from the primordial inflation? This Those is my are, first question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll can tell I answer, another one. Can I answer the Other? first one? Those are primordial gravitational waves. Primordial. They're very different from the one which have been observed by LIGO, for example. LIGO is coming to us from, say, a few billion years, whereas the primordial are co coming all the way from 13 billion years ago. From the beginning, yes. From the beginning, thing. yes. This is why they're very bold. They are much more weak. They yeah, are extremely extremely more weak. To find, yes. And my second question are there some theoretical models where the primordial uh, the sitter, this positive vacuum energy somehow logically correlated with dark energy, which we observe today, the very small dark yes. energy. Or there are no correlations, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, there are. So we want, uh, after the exit from inflation, to end up not in Minkowski, but in a space with tiny, tiny, 10 to the minus 120 and Planck to the four cosmological constant. This is how we build our models. This is where Volkov Akulov non-linearly realized supersymmetry was so powerful because Volkov Akulov action or anti d brain action is precisely giving positive contribution and it has to be slightly bigger than the contribution which we always have to the energy from the negative, a negative contribution due to gravitino mass. And these two mechanisms allow us 
to make in our models exit from inflation into De Sitter rather than in Minkowski or in anti De Sitter where the universe would collapse. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you. Okay. More questions, please. Okay. Uh, Sraven, please. Uh. Hi, Renata. Thank you for that very nice talk. I have a couple of questions. My first question is about uh, cosmological constant. You gave this anthropic explanation in the difference between the Volkov flow constant and the gravity normals. But uh, if H0 tension is true, and if it is not lambda CDM, then what is your explanation according to Yeah, you? yeah. So we have constructed the model. I think I have them in my backup slides. They're called uh, quintessential alpha attractors. Let me just find here. So uh, some, some years ago, we decided precisely that uh, future data may either support cosmological constant which would mean equation of state W equals minus one, or they will give us some W depending on, uh, on redshift. And just in case people worked on something which is known as quintessential models. And we uh, uh, worked out our model, which we called quintessential alpha attractors. What you see, we have one plateau here responsible for inflation. And instead of um, exit having a, a minimum in the sitter, we just have a second plateau here. And this would mean various things. We are capable meet the data if they will find that cosmological constant is actually not a constant. And we have to deal with some kind of dark energy and we have enough options here and enough parameter to address this case, as well as other people who are working on quintessential models. Does it answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I have a related question here. So in, this, in these models, uh, because you don't have minima of the potential, so how does the Just reheating keep running. work? Yeah. Uh, Just reheating, keep running. How, uh, yes, but how, how does the reheating work in this model? Sorry. Um, okay. Yes, there is a very beautiful feature of this model, which we observed that uh, there is a, a stage called kination in addition to everything else, which allows to change the number of evolving by plus 10. And it could happen that future data will require something like that. And so there, there was a lot of recent studies also uh, with regard to primordial black hole uh, creation by the end of inflation. So I think current interest in particular involves quintessential models and or uh, various steps or, or, or uh, inflection points uh, close to the exit and so the focus of many people as of now is to modify, to consider various modification of these models, which will be capable of addressing the future data. One of them is that um, it is not a cosmological constant, but it is a dark energy changing in time. And so there are many very recent paper where people are asking precisely these kind of questions because next 10 years will give us some data on this. And it is not guaranteed that it will be just plain de -sitter. It could be something else. As well as we still have the issue of age zero tension. We have to think about models with early uh, or new early dark energy. And so, there are many things which may still happen because of the data. So I think people are preparing various um, combination of models, which are not necessarily required now, but may be useful in the future. Okay, uh, can I ask one last question? So 
all the models you explain are built on supergravity, but uh, detection of tensor uh, primordial gravitation waves do, does not validate uh, supergravity if there is supergravity no. in the, the universe. So, oh, oh, what is the smoking gun signature you think uh, right. <laughs> uh, from I, primordial? I, <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. So, uh, whatever theorists are thinking, is not the motivation of people who do experiment. They just want to know what is there in the sky and they will do experiment. However, uh, theorists are trying to use the data from the sky to sort out their understanding of what fundamental physics is. And for me, if Planck data in terms of where NS is now will remain valid, it is in particular something confirming uh, ideas of our group about what kind of models fit the data. And of course, there is no immediate connection, but there is kind of support of data which we choose uh, when we find models which are compatible with current and especially with future data. It is only support, it is not immediate simple uh, uh, connection. Thank you. Okay, more questions, please. I don't see more. Maybe <coughs> I will ask the following technical uh, question. Renata, you, during your talk, you have mentioned many times about work of Akurov nonlinear model. As I understand, this is non renormalizable model. Is this true? If yes, do you expect that is some kind of effective model? And if it yeah. is a Effective model, we have to introduce some uh, some uh, extra parameter which regularize this. Yeah, all all of of all of the discussion of um, gravity, in fact. Oh, oh yes, and, it's true. Yes. When we deal with cosmology, we have to involve gravity. So the issue of um, renormalizable theory is not something we can easily address. We are trying to build an effective theory which has certain properties. Mm -hmm. In particular, whether it is property associated with non-linearly realized supersymmetry, which allows us to build effective theory. But on top of it, in particular for um, alpha attractors, there are certain type of um, observations that uh, they are stable towards quantum corrections and uh, this has to do with this plateau, approaching the plateau. But uh, it's not um, important maybe in, in this more general picture. If we deal with cosmology, we need gravity and we don't have a simple QFT of gravity. That's the answer. So we do the best we can by saying, this is the effective theory which we use to learn how to understand the data. Mm -hmm. It's not QFT, no. Yes. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, Sergey Vernov, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is what happens before inflation in your model? What is a cosmology? That's a valid question. And I believe uh, our understanding at present is it would be great to know the answer. And yes, we don't have it. To some extent, the, the acceptance of inflation is, is maybe indication that we can manage this very early stage of the universe and we can explain seven features observed in CMB through inflation. But, and we, we are able, we seem to be able to do it without uh, having an answer to your question. Yes, we don't know how to deal with singularity, but it didn't prevent us from uh, explaining the data from CMB via inflation, which happened soon after. But yes, we don't have, a, everybody would like to know how to go through singularity or what exactly happened before inflation. 
Sorry. And maybe another question, what you say about primordial gravitational waves and primordial black holes. Is, I, it, is it connected or not? Uh, you, what no. is the reason of the... No, no. Um, B modes are uh, gravitational waves coming to us as tensor perturbation during inflation. The one which we are, we, which we see on the sky, they are scalar perturbation. This is what we see on Planck map, all the dots. We don't see gravitational waves and their level uh, is something which we would like to know. This is why we are spending a huge amount of money on this uh, to understand primordial gravitational waves coming from inflation. Meanwhile, uh, one of the basic reason why people are interested now in primordial black hole is that um, the ones which were created in the early stages of inflation are gone. They are somewhere far away. But the one which were created close to the exit, they might be relevant to the issue of dark matter because all attempts to find dark matter through axions or dark photons or uh, supersymmetric particles so far were not working. And some people uh, concluded that having uh, primordial black holes associated with dark matter might be one of the things to find out. And so the one which are created close to the exit of inflation are now under Scrutiny, people are trying to see how to do it. They have to bend the potential. And then they see that in some cases, they might be black holes, which contributes to, to dark matter. In some cases, things are more complicated, but there are many papers now on yeah, this, yeah, but I they're know. not related. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is, uh, but I think it is possible that the module gravitations uh, the model black holes also generate some gravitational waves. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That is and how how you can separate oh, okay. and understand? Is okay, a, let me explain. This is absolutely correct. So mm -hmm. the creation of primordial black holes close to the exit of inflation produces certain gravitational waves, which will be hopefully detected by LISA. And yes, this is a uh, class of uh, additional gravitational waves, which is not of the level which LIGO can see, and they're not B modes from inflation. They have been uh, produced in this uh, dramatic process of creation of primordial black holes near the exit to inflation, and they have observational signatures for LISA, which people study. And um, I can give you references if you send me your email. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, my next questions or comments from Andre Linde. Andre, please. Hey, it, it just, well, uh, the question about uh, what happened before inflation and maybe the question about what was exactly the singularity, etc. and they did not answer it. Uh, I just wanted to add something to this answer. Uh, yeah, we really don't know how to describe the creation of everything, okay? Uh, we have some ideas how to do it. We have some quantum uh, cosmology suggestions, what is wave function of the whole universe, etc. All of this is very controversial and interpretation is extremely difficult. But there is one uh, consideration which lets, uh, lets us hope that what we are doing makes sense. And that is a comparison between what we are doing and what uh, people study when they study Hawking radiation from the black hole. So black hole has a horizon. You throw something uh, uh, under the horizon, you're never going to see it, and you will never going to see the singularity. There is this, uh, well, uh, conjecture that singularity is always hidden under the horizon, okay? So no, no naked singularities. Um, what happens in inflation? Uh, universe is exponentially expanding. 
you throw something it runs away from you and it's hidden under the cosmological horizon uh, the geometry of the sitter space in certain coordinates looks like as if you were surrounded by a black hole okay so you are not going to see the cosmological singularity you're never going to obtain any information from the cosmological singularity what you see is something outside of it okay so we do not know how to solve the, uh, the singularity problem inside the black hole. We do not know how to solve the singularity problem for the inflationary universe. But in both of these cases, the horizon prevents us from necessity to solve it, to answer many other complicated questions. Uh, in particular, this uh, uh, cosmological radiation, well, these gravitational waves and scalar waves and uh, perturbations which are producing galaxies, they essentially produced by a mechanism very, very closely related to Hawking radiation, Hawking evaporation of black holes. It's just in a different environment. So it's kind of very similar status. And uh, in a sense, the existence of the horizon, I, I'm trying to emphasize this strange point. The fact that we will never see cosmological singularity in this context allows us to uh, think that what we are uh, well, discussing is probably more reliable than it would be otherwise. Okay, thank you. Please, may I ask one more question? Uh, okay, okay, just uh, and, and then Alexei Koshinov can ask you. Okay, please, Boris, ask with your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Renato, please tell, uh, did you consider your colleagues some models where universe of more than four dimensions inflates? The point is that uh, four dimensions are very special in Maxwell theory, in Abelian theory, because only in four dimensions, electromagnetic action is exactly scale invariant. And in other dimensions, uh, it's not so. And my question, uh, does this special, special feature of four dimensions have some dynamical influence on dynamics of inflation in high dimensions? Um. Okay, so my answer, and, and they may uh, correct, is the following. Uh, when people in string community, including uh, Brian Green, were trying to prove that you can, do, you can perform compactification of string theory to arbitrary dimension, but that it should be a preference to four. And I think these attempts never actually worked, but it was other way around. If we know that we uh, uh, want to compactify uh, 11 or 10 dimension to four, then we have very good model. We know how to do it and uh, it works. And then we can explain the data. But to predict uh, that compactification from fundamental theory will give us D equals four and only D equals four, I don't think this is something uh, which anybody has done. The people but, tried. But uh, this special dynamics of abelian electromagnetic fluctuations in four dimensions, does it influence somehow the dynamics of inflation as it is? Mm, not to my knowledge. Mm, thank you. Okay. My next question from Alexei Koshilev. Alexei, please ask. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Maybe I want to reiterate the question which was asked last time to Professor Linde. And uh, still I'm curious about this. Uh, and the question is, because Professor Linde was directly pointing out that most likely Renate Kalash will answer this in her talk or somehow mention this. Uh, I you, a few answers, but uh, tell me which one. Can formula anomaly in this case oh, okay. of detractors. Okay, let me let me uh, uh, um, show you uh, what I was planning to say. I have few comments to things which were raised after um, after Andre's talk uh, in my backup slides. 
here, by the way, about primordial black holes. Okay, so about cosmology. Uh, there are many things about anomalies, which one can say, but the one aspect of it, which I am interested, I, I point out here. Uh, and uh, is Tokariva here? I think she asked the question. Mm, yeah. Or you can... Most likely she's not here, but I remember the question because I'm also curious. Yeah. Right. So I have no reaction to uh, her recent work with um, Shapashnikov. I had no time to read it, but I had some uh, comments of the following nature that in QFT, anomalies in standard model cancel. We are very lucky. It's a normalizable theory and anomalies cancel. Yeah. But in cosmology, we are forced to look at some kind of effective general relativity in D equals four, which is explaining the observation. This is one ingredient. Secondly, uh, some gravitational theory like M theory, string theory and maximal N equals eight supergravity are believed to be free of anomalies. And I brought here an example, uh, relatively recent. So Meissner and Nicola in 2016 uh, have noticed something and I had a paper on this about cancellation of conformal anomalies in N uh, five, six, seven, eight supergravity. In particular, uh, there are two types of anomalies. One is known with the square of vial tensor, which is equivalent to square of um, Riemann tensor and Ricci and scalar curvature. And the other is associated with, uh, with the topological invariant. And for example, for, uh, for this uh, vial anomaly, there is a contribution which uh, involves contribution from gravitons, from eight gravitina, from 28 vectors, 56 um, uh, spinners, and 70 scalars, and they just cancel. And this is the reason, I think I put it here, when building cosmological models, we try to use M theory, string theory, and maximum supergravity as much as possible. And we keep it sequestered, which is what I was, is the best we can do now. To compare this model with observation, we need to add some phenomenology part as described in my talk today. So one of the reasons for me to view the connection to string theory to M theory as important because of these theories are more fundamental. In particular, they have this cancellation of anomalies. But this is the best I can say now. And in the context of gravity, especially as Irina uh, uh, noticed, what can we do? It's not quantum field theory. On the other hand, we have data. We don't expect have particle physics accelerators soon. So in foreseeable next two decades, we have much more data from cosmology from the sky, and those are based on relativity. So our standards, I believe, have to be like that. We would like to use as much as possible theories known to have, have no anomalies, but at some point you can't really stay in D equals 10. <laughs> you have to see the observable world somehow. Yeah, exactly. And so this is what I was trying to explain today, that our current unless there is some significant scientific revolution in our understanding how to deal with gravity. Yes, anomalies are important. And therefore, if accidentally they will discover a primordial gravitational wave at the level of one of the seven disks, it will be the indication that fundamental theory have something to say with regard to first moments of, uh, of the universe. And if not, we'll have to to see what will happen. I see. So if I got it, I right, had I had another comment. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there was a discussion of um, uh, papers by Starobinsky and you and other people, and I looked at these papers and I found the following: that once you add non-local R squared inflation, because Indeed, many future data may help us to understand what is the right model. Instead of sitting at these two points, 
with the help of non-local terms, uh, you can move up and down, but there is a feature that tensor tilt can be positive in contrast to local gravity models. And this is what uh, is interesting. So as I said, we accumulate models of different kinds for the future data. And this is my current comment. I also had the comment on, I don't know, is anybody interesting, interested in, in this? I'll go quickly. So there was recently a review on some plant conjectures. And these four papers, they're young theoretical physicists. None of them ever worked in cosmology. And when we looked at the axion inflation, they didn't know about the new data. And so all models they discuss are disfavored as of now. On the other hand, there was another recent paper uh, by uh, young people who know some string theory, but also there was a very well-known cosmologist there. And they, uh, this combination of authors produced the paper on early dark sector, Hubble tension sampling. And this is interesting because they uh, displayed various conjectures uh, which can be checked in future data. And so if somebody wants in the young generation work on uh, swamp line conjecture, the advice is then have somebody in your team who knows how to, 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 to test the conjectures. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting answer. So did I get it right that uh, you uh, propose to think about n greater than four series as a fundamental subject, uh, so as some fundamental construction for our world to cancel anomaly. And for the moment, it's uh, maybe well. Uh, let me let me make it a bit softer. It is known that if I am in d equals four, which may not be fundamental, or if I am in d equals 11 or 10, there are certain symmetries. And yeah, some yeah. version of these symmetries is behind the model, which are literally tested by experiments. And so the inspiration for these models are com is coming from models which are anomaly free. But it doesn't mean that they will show up in the data. Yeah, this is it will be long yeah. waiting time. Yeah. But it's good to have this uh, perspective. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. More questions, please. I don't see more questions. Yes. If I I have a special announcement for Andrei Linda in Russian. Дорогой Андрей, через четыре дня исполнится 50 лет со дня окончания нашего физического факультета. Я хочу сообщить тебе, что мы собираемся примерно в середине апреля, и те, кто не сможет присутствовать лично, могут с нами пообщаться по зуму. Дорогой Андрей, еще раз поздравляю с замечательным нашим юбилеем. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for attention. Okay, this is nothing secret. So the people who don't understand Russian, first of all, can study Russian, okay, or switch on to a translator. But in any case, it was about some anniversary of um, uh, end of a universe of uh, 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 of, of say of, okay. I guess. So, Fifty but, years anniversary of the end of the university. Uh, yes, of the end of the university. Yes. Okay. If there is no more announcement and no more question, let's thank Renata for wonderful talk. Thank you very much. The discussion also was great. Thank you all for um, participating in our seminar. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank See you. Me. Stay Thank well. You. Stay yeah. well. Thank Bye. you. Guys.